How are you? I'm doing well, man. Thanks. How are you doing? Not bad. Where are you? I'm in Vancouver. How's Vancouver? Well, you never, you never guess it. It happens to be raining today, <laughs> and it was raining yesterday. But I hear that the the, the summer's coming, so we'll see what happens. Well, but hopefully, <laughs> were, were you a Mighty Ducks? You must have been a Mighty Ducks kid. I was uh, beyond a Mighty Ducks kid. I actually burned out the second VHS tape with my brothers watching Mighty Ducks one, two, and three on repeat for for several years. So we were we were a Mighty Ducks family through and through. I have a, a lot of Mighty Ducks uh, memorabilia hanging around the house. There's something about it, hey. I think for kids of our age, you know, I think like maybe a generation older than, mind you, I think you're younger than me, but like a generation older than us, I think they had Slapshot and movies like that, you know. And I feel like this was sort of this was sort of for us. Yeah, I mean, this was the, I remember watching Mighty Ducks thinking, I can't wait for music to play in between the shifts. And I, I can't wait for, uh, you know, to have proper fans in the stands and, and to have a coach like Bombay. I mean, it was certainly something that I was, uh, I was very excited about when, when, the, when the film came out. It was, it was cool, you know, I felt like it was, it was made for me. And, and I think a lot of people felt the same way. And then that was a, uh, yeah, what a what a wild thing to be a part of, man. Just a, such a nostalgic experience, but also with like a fresh new take, you know? Yeah, and I'm trying not to give away anything. I think I can give this away because it's in the beginning of the first episode, but the ducks are sort of, they're the heroes, but also not the heroes too. Can you give us, just yeah, give us no, the brief I, synopsis? Yeah, certainly. I think we can give that story point away. So the ducks have become, uh, they're now a high level academy team. Um, costs a lot of money to put your kids in a ducks uniform. Um, they're winning state championship after state championship. They're essentially the, the, the new powerhouse team in Minnesota. And, uh, and with that comes young coaches who are looking to make the NHL, like the character I play coach T and really overbearing parents who believe, you know, their, their 401k retirement plan lies in their children's success as a hockey player a lot like the Hawks and uh, they, they, they sort of, like you said, they reveal that right in the beginning and it opens up an opportunity for, for a new version of, of the Ducks to, to come about and sort of challenge the ethos of what they've become, which is quite far from, you know, what made the, the original Ducks so special. Your father is a, a coach, right? That's right. Yeah. He's an associate coach of the Oilers, the Edmonton Oilers. His name is? Jim Playfair. And what's he like? Uh, in, I mean, he's, he's a very, very supportive dad, a really, really passionate hockey coach. I think, uh, he gained, uh, notoriety through, uh, through a YouTube clip back when he was coaching the American league with the, uh, Abbotsford heat where he, there was a call made he disagreed with. He ripped his jacket off and broke a couple <laughs> of sticks in protest to the call. Uh, <laughs> that's been seen around the world a couple, uh, a million times, I believe actually, um, but uh, you know, it's funny when I when I made the transition from from hockey into acting, he was one of the most supportive. I mean, my whole family was supportive, but his whole philosophy was, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And he he loves hockey, and he understood the the challenges and the struggles that go with doing something like hockey. You know, a coach is hired to be fired, and you're constantly you know, under the gun and, and there's a lot of pressure and you started on the East Coast League and he made it all the way to the NHL and my brothers and I and my mom, we were along for that whole journey. So for him, it was always something that he, he knew that we understood how hard it was to be a hockey coach and to be a hockey player. And I think when I decided to transition and pursue, pursue film, he had made a very similar sort of series of choices in, in his in his youth where he decided to go pursue hockey. And I think we're all told, um, you know, it's hard to be an NHL hockey player. It's hard to be a hockey coach. It's hard to be an actor. It's hard to do a lot of these things, but for him, he never wanted me to feel the the sense of regret. He's like, listen, if you want to do this thing, you, you should go do it. And you should never feel like uh, the game that has given us so much has held you back in any way, shape or form because hockey has given so much to our family and, and, I don't ever want you to feel like hockey stopped you from doing something. I want you to still love the game the way, the way I love it and the way that I, I see you have passion for it. So, you know, trust your gut and follow your heart and, and pursue this thing before you, you know, play two or three more seasons and look back and go, I wish I'd done that sooner. So, um, yeah, I got really fortunate that the way my, my dad sort of looked at the whole big picture of it all. How far did you get in hockey? I played junior A for the Merit Centennials. I played 
a, a season with them. And then I played a season of junior B before that. But um, I mean, I, I probably could have gotten a college scholarship, but I don't think I was going to make the NHL. I, I might have been able to, to charge it out over in Europe, but uh, I, I feel like I made the right decision. Yeah, yeah I'd say so. Um, why acting? I just, you know, I loved, I loved performing ever since I was a, a young kid. And I think, you know, when I was, when I was in grade school, I uh, diagnosed, you know, ADD, ADHD, lots of energy, lots of, you know, buzzing around, wanting to do five different things at once, very vocal in class. I was quite disruptive. I think I was a teacher's worst nightmare, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I know, I know that one well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Um, but, but in saying that, you know, you look back and now that I'm, now that I'm an actor and I've been doing this for, for a while, I see a lot of the same personalities in, in filmmakers and in entertainers and artists is this sort of like this desire to, to, to think outside the box. And there's a, a, a sense of sort of performance you want to, you want to be on and it's, and it's fun to do things that sort of get a rise out of people. And, and I felt that, that sense when I was in school. And then also when I was playing hockey, I was always a very vocal person in the dressing room and I always loved telling stories and telling jokes. And it was something that I, I felt came easily to me. And, you know, when I was in, in high school, we did a play, we did a, a short version of Hamlet. It's called like a half hour Hamlet or 15 minute Hamlet. I forget what it was, but I, I got the chance to play the lead character. I, I was, I was Hamlet and uh, my poor drama teacher, I, I decided whether or not it was the right decision, but I thought Hamlet could be a comedy. I thought it could be funny. Oh yeah, to put some to put some comedic uh, flair into the character, and uh, you know that sense of hearing the the audience laugh when you do something, and you know you think it's funny, they think it's funny too, and you get this sort of relationship built to the audience. That was for sure the seed that was planted. And then you know when I was nineteen, I was playing hockey in Merritt. I was watching Friday Night Lights, and I found out Taylor Kitsch had played in the same league, so. When I asked my coach about him, because I knew they played against each other, he gave me his his story and his journey from the BCHL into Friday Night Lights, essentially. And I remember going home that night and just thinking, I, I can do that. Like, if, if he can do that, it, just because I don't live in L.A. or I don't live in New York doesn't mean I can't get there somehow. And that was sort of the, the door that cracked open. And I was, I was really excited about finding out he had done something similar. And, you know, it was, I think, almost two months later, I was off off the team and on my way to Mer on my way to Vancouver from there to to start acting. I mean, and it's interesting because I think hockey was the way you even ended up furthering your career. I, you know, people who were listening to this would know you from Letterkenny is Riley, and of course you play a, a hockey player um, on that. Mm -hmm. But y you got Letterkenny sort of because Jared Kiso, who created Letterkenny and is co-created mm -hmm. and is a big part of it, um, is a hockey player as well. Didn't you get on Letterkenny sort of because of hockey? Hundred percent. Yeah, I actually met Jared through the Trappers hockey team, which is you know myself, Andrew Herb, Tyler Johnson, Jerry Kiso, Nate Dales. Um, geez, even the, like we had basically the whole cast was on there. Uh, Jamie Lapointe, who, who who plays his character's name is the Ginger on the show, he was on the the Trappers. So um, that show was born out of the, the humor that we had in the dressing room just with each other and, and us all being actors out in Vancouver, you know, Jared felt there was an opportunity to, to work with his friends and to, and to tell stories that, that he knew and was familiar with. And um, Andrew Hur and I had actually just come back from playing brothers in the CBC movie, Mr. Hockey, the Gordie Howe story. So that right, was right. I remember Mr. Hockey, the Gordie Howe story. Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. But I played Marty in that and, and Andrew played my brother, Mark. And that was sort of the, the, the light bulb moment, I guess, for Jared, where he goes, you guys should play hockey players in letter canning. Like, that would be that would be fun for the YouTube bit. And then obviously that segued into an episode or season order for, for letter Kenny. And I mean, now we're going into season 10. It's crazy. My, my favorite thing to do when it comes to letter Kenny, I don't know if you, I mean, I never talk about this too much, but I, w I once did a video with Jared where mm -hmm. I gave him a bunch of Newfoundland slang. And yeah. then he gave me a bunch of letter Kenny sl slang back and forth. And I think a lot of the Newfoundland slang from our interview got into the show when Terry Ryan was on and he was the Newfoundland yeah. character and all that. So I wanted to play a little bit of the dialogue. This is your character, Riley, and his buddy Jonesy. 
None of these donkeys even dip, bro. These chumps even chew, bro. Like, none of these dunces ever had a dinger. These losers never had a lipper, bro. Like, chill out. Have a chop. Peace out. Have a pull. Have a hogger. Have a danger. Have a hammer. Say hello to Sergeant Spitter, boys. Chris Spitter. So, here's what I want to know. What vernacular have you brought from playing hockey into Letterkenny? Ah, oh, man. Uh... <laughs> I want to claim Ferda, but for, I mean Ferda is such a big part now of the hockey players' um, vernacular. Ferda, yeah, Ferda, Ferda boys, which is something that the the boys say often, and now most of the cast says Ferda. Um, but a little sort of inside secret, I'll, I'll let the world in on is at the time when we were filming the first three seasons of Letterkenny, my brothers were still playing in the Western League, so before I'd go to film. I would ask them, hey, send me the latest and greatest vernacular. Like, what are the boys saying in the room? And they would both come through in the clutch every single time. And I get a long, long text message from both of them. And I'd send that to Jared. And uh, he and I would kind of find find the funniest, most unique, you know, topical one. So I've got a couple of insiders. And now, uh, now with my dad, obviously, in the NHL, and I'm sort of coming of age with a lot of the, the guys who are, who are playing in the league. I get it through my dad now, so I still got my my finger on the pulse of the vernacular. But uh, what what vernacular know, has your father given you? Uh, Bardowski, I guess Bardowski, humming high hard ones. He he loves high hard ones, humming high hard ones in the blue line. Just leaning into it, just dropping me high half clappers. You got to define that for the CBC listening audience right now, Dylan. Okay, humming a high hard one is like uh, leaning into a slap shot and putting it like shoulder level. Uh, oh yeah, scared. humming a high, high, humming a high hard one. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, putting a bar down ski is you know putting the puck bar down. Ding. Um, knee, <laughs> knee high half clapper. That's a real classic sort of. Uh, you see it oftentimes. Like Mike Camilleri was was really good at it. You uh you, you get down low and drop your knee and it's a it looks like a slap shot but the blade only comes up to about your knee and then you follow through all the way as if you're finishing a slap shot. I mean, there's a lot to it. It's a it's a whole language. Eventually, I think it's going to have its own uh, its own dictionary. I think it's starting to make it into. I think it's starting to go the other way too. Like I think that hockey vernacular from the NHL and the you know ECHL and it made its way into Letterkenny. I think Letterkenny vernacular is making its. From what I'm hearing, is making its way into hockey too, right? I'll get calls from my dad after NHL hockey games where he'll be on the way back to the hotel going through, and I had a referee lean up against the bench. And told me to wheel snipe Sally. <laughs> and and I guess like because now, you know, the like you said, the, the, the players in the NHL, I mean, they're a lot of them are younger than us, which is just a, a trip in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but now to to hear that the vernacular is showing up in the in the game is it's very cool. It's a it's a trip. I want I, I want to one's making it now. <laughs> I want to play a clip right now. This is the last time Jared was here. This was I haven't seen Jared in years. This is about, well, I mean, I see him socially, but I haven't, he hasn't been on the show in years. This is probably four or five years ago. Uh, the show was just getting going. Um, this show was just getting going. Here's what he had to say about Riley. Riley and Jonesy, who were played by Dylan Playfair and Andrew Herr, I never intended for them to be kind of that that goofy. But what they brought to set, it just worked so well. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that if if there's any crew that's that's in Letter Kenny that's a hit more than any more than any other crew, it'd be the hockey players. They're just going over so so well. So you can't argue with that. I think he's really on to something there. That's Jared Kiso, the creator of Letter Kenny. You guys could have you, you could have played. That character in a lot of different ways and the most obvious way to play it is a sort of a dumb jockey dude you know which is no disrespect to dumb jockey dudes some of my best friends are dumb jockey dudes but i and that's maybe that's what i thought it was when i first saw you on it but it doesn't take long to watch it till you start to realize there's something more there that really kind of attracts audiences to the character so what is it about your characters that you think people are so drawn to i i really love playing I don't want to call Riley a bad guy because he's not a bad guy. Riley and Jonesy aren't, aren't bad guys, but they do a lot of stuff that sort of, it could be painted with that dumb jock brush and then that sort of broad stroke of like, they could be quite antagonistic. And I think finding redeemable qualities in these otherwise unredeemable characters is something that I have a lot of fun doing. Um, there's something really fun about playing dumb because you kind of have to be aware of, of why the guy's dumb you know and i just 
I don't know. I really love Riley and Jonesy. I think that like their, their bromance is, I mean, I got really lucky with Andrew because he and I had been friends for a long time before the show became what it is. So we had this rapport with each other off screen that we were able to carry over. And then we also had that same rapport with so many of the, of the other cast members off screen and on screen where I really feel like Riley is probably one of the closest characters to, to my personality. Just everything's cranked up, you know, the, the humor is cranked up, but the, the genuine, like, they're not bullies, you know, they, as much as they're, they're not treating rookies the way that rookies should be treated, but they're doing it because that's how they know how to like bring these guys into their world. And they really, as much as they want to fight everyone, they really want to be liked by, by Jared's character and they really want to be liked by, by everyone around them. And I think there's something so endearing about like playing a guy who just doesn't quite understand <laughs> his place in the world. And I think that was, you know, for, for Andrew and I, we both play hockey and we both, you know, our careers didn't take us to the NHL and, and it sort of, we had to find our, our place in the world. And I really think that's what Riley and Jones are doing. And I guess to, to answer the question, it's like, those characters are honest and they're, they're easy to play because it's not, we're not reaching for comedy. We're not reaching for the honest moments. A lot of those, a lot of those elements of the character are within me and Andrew, I think naturally. So yeah, I, I guess there's an honesty to the characters. And maybe this is a good way to close things off. Um, you know, you're here in, in the new Mighty Ducks, the game changers, and it's a, you know, it's, it's a very big deal. And like we said at the very beginning, it's sort of a full circle moment for you. I mean, you, 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 burnt out the VHS of the Mighty Ducks and you played hockey growing up and your dad's still in the game and your family's you're st still in the game. I came back to hockey recently. I, I watched it a lot when I was a kid and I, I don't know if it's just because I really like the Habs right now too, like they're my team, but they're good and young and fast and I really like them. I've started watching it again, but I also think that I had this conversation a little while ago with a musician and he wrote a song about hockey players and I said, what's going on with Canadian musicians always writing songs about hockey players? It can't just be you know, the national identity thing. Mm -hmm. And he said, Tom, like, aren't we cut from the same cloth? Like, isn't our sort of destiny predetermined for us when we're good at guitar at eight, the same as when we're good at hockey at eight? And aren't we still just trying to find our way in the world, in an industry that sometimes doesn't want us, but try to, you know, make a life for ourselves? So maybe the way I want to end is, and you touched on this a bit earlier, but I'd love to go down this path a little bit more. What connections do you see now on both sides between being an artist and being a hockey player? Yeah, I mean, what a beautiful way to, to, to pose that question. I mean, it, it really, the, the parallels are, there's many, many of them. And I, I use the term fall forward all the time because in, in acting, in any art, you have to, there's a lot of no's in between the yeses, um, a lot of no's. And, and I think you have to understand that it's a part of this, this bigger journey. It's not this one game or this one audition. And coming from the world of hockey, where if you, if you dwell on a bad shift or if you dwell on a game that didn't go your way or, or even a season or an injury or something, that can really cloud the next opportunity. And you might miss that next opportunity if you're stuck in this sort of defeatist mentality. And for me, when I, when I came into to acting, I came in with, with a lot of these lessons already learned where I, I had watched really skilled guys and how they handled adversity. And I thought, you know, some of the best players are having fun when they're playing. And I, and I want to do something where I'm having fun all the time. And even the hard work is going to be fun. And, and for me, that was acting where, you know, even those auditions where you come close and you don't get it, I never felt this like, this doom feeling. I always felt like, oh, that was cool. Like I, someone liked me enough to get me that far in the process. And, and who knows what the next opportunity will bring. And I think when you have that outlook in, in life in general, not just in a career, you start to see opportunities where you might not have seen them before. I mean, I, I wouldn't have gotten Mighty Ducks had I not done Letterkenny. And even, you know, with the, the way the pandemic moved the filming schedule, my character arc wouldn't have been as long as it was had the pandemic not happened. So of course the pandemic's a tragedy, but the silver lining of it is I, I got to be in this, in this character's world for, for seven episodes as opposed to one or two. And, you know, with, with, with letter Kenny, I mean, this show that, that like we never in a million years thought it was going to become what it was. 
And from a YouTube series made with friends to, to 10 seasons later, the opportunities that that has presented, I mean, you, you never would have to, to convince an agent, hey, I'm going to go out and do this thing for, for free. It's going to be on YouTube. It's it's non union. It's whatever. I mean, that would have been for for my agent at the time, probably. What are you doing? Don't go do that. But <laughs> that opportunity becomes this incredible thing that has carried on into into what it is today. So I think, you know, I learned that from playing hockey is like fell forward and, and understand it's a much longer journey than just the, the thing you're looking at right in front of you. That's a beautiful way of, of looking at life. And, and, and they have far more in common than I ever considered. Lovely to talk to you. Congrats on the show. Tom, thanks so much, man. I really enjoyed that.